By a show of hands, how many, agree, how many of you agree with the statement, it's wrong to hurt animals unnecessarily? And I know we can disagree about what necessary means, so by your definition of necessary. Great, that looks like most of you. And this is generally what I find most places I ask people this question. The vast majority of people consider themselves to be animal lovers, or at least think animal abuse is wrong and not morally justifiable. Now consider this number, 70 billion. This is the number of land animals that we are raising and killing for meat, dairy, and eggs every single year around the world. And in the US alone, this number is 10 billion. That's still more than the entire human population. And if we killed humans at the rate that we are killing non-human animals, we would be extinct in just two weeks. So how do we reconcile the fact that we are generally against animal abuse and suffering, yet we are raising, confining, and killing these sentient feeling beings on the most massive scale we've ever seen in history? Now, I've been speaking up for animals and the planet since I was about seven years old, and one of the things I've realized over time as an activist is that good people can have different values, different beliefs, and disagree on what really matters or how best to create change in the world. So my goal today is not to try and change your values or your beliefs. Rather, I want to ask you, what are your values? What kind of world do you want to see? And are you doing your best to live in alignment with those values and make choices and actions that are going to help create the world you want? So with that in mind, let me introduce myself. I'm Serena, I'm a vegan educator and activist, and maybe most surprisingly, I've been vegan since birth. This means I've never intentionally eaten meat, dairy, or eggs in my entire life, and I don't wear wool, fur, silk, or leather, or use any products or cosmetics that were tested on animals. And I spend most of my time attending protests and creating content and traveling around speaking to people about the ethics and sustainability of eating animals. And this is where I currently live. And yes, hashtag van life is most definitely not as glamorous as most influencers make it out to be. <laughs> Growing up vegan in Kansas with an activist mother was a unique experience, to say the least, but one that I am incredibly grateful for. My parents not only fed me an exclusively plant-based diet, but they also told me the truth about where meat and other animal products come from at a very young age. They used simple explanations such as, we love animals, we don't eat them, and cow's milk is for baby cows. And this made perfect sense to me. Being vegan really fed my mind, body, and soul. I was a huge animal lover, and we shared our home with a number of different rescued animals, including cats, dogs, guinea pigs, and even some turkeys and geese when I was really little. So when my parents explained to me why I had a tofu sandwich in my lunchbox instead of a ham and cheese, or why I couldn't eat the same ice cream as my friends, the hardest part for me wasn't feeling deprived or left out. Rather, it was struggling to understand how my good, caring friends were eating animals. I believe most children are born with an innate compassion for others and would not knowingly choose to eat animals if given a real choice. But unlike me, most people in America grow up repeatedly seeing and hearing things like milk grows strong bones and beef, it's what's for dinner, and are indoctrinated into believing that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And I've seen this indoctrination affect even the most educated members of society. I remember when I was on a competitive gymnastics team as a kid, and we went to go see a new doctor for a physical exam who heavily tried to fearmonger us. When he learned that I had never drank cow's milk in my entire life, he freaked out and wanted to run a bunch of tests on me, certain that I must be calcium, protein, and just generally nutrient deficient. Never mind the fact that I could do a back handspring on the balance beam, had won second at state, and was one of the few members of my team who had never broken a single bone. But nonetheless, this doctor was absolutely shocked when all of my test results came back showing I was thriving. Now, I don't share this with you to convince you that growing up vegan made me invincible or some kind of world-class athlete. 
because that is most definitely not true. But I share it with you simply as an example of how we humans absolutely can thrive on plant-based diets. Slogans and ideas like milk is necessary for strong bones or animal flesh is necessary for protein are not scientific fact. Rather, they are mostly marketing and propaganda from large, powerful corporations that have a vested interest in obscuring the truth from us and convincing us to con continue consuming and purchasing their products, even when those products may be at odds with our stated values and innate compassion. Take factory farming, for example. Factory farms, otherwise known as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs for short, have become increasingly recognized over the last decade for their cruel and unethical treatment of animals, as well as the negative environmental and health toll they take on the planet and people who live and work nearby them. Now, what I'm about to show you might be difficult for some of you to see, especially if you are still a beneficiary of the products of these systems. These images are images of what a standard pig CAFO here in Iowa tends to look like. They are large industrial operations with big metal barns where hundreds if not thousands of pigs are crammed together, often barely able to stand up or without enough room to turn around, never getting to go outside or see the sun, with disease so rampant that many of the animals die prematurely and are simply tossed in the trash. And although these conditions vary slightly depending on what animals are raised for, these basic facts are fairly similar for animals of other species in factory farms as well. It is also standard legal practice across the entire animal agriculture industry to forcibly impregnate females, separate mothers and babies, especially in the dairy industry, use painful electric prods to get animals to go where we want them to go, and cause routine mutilations such as cutting off their toes, tails, ears, beaks, and testicles, all without any painkillers. However, as awareness as these type of farms has grown, more and more people have become concerned about the treatment of animals in them and made an effort to advocate for, promote, and purchase products from animals that were supposedly raised humanely. In fact, surveys from the Sentient Institute show that 75% of Americans believe they are usually purchasing products from humanely raised animals. So how can it be that many people are concerned about factory farming and doing their best to purchase animal products from other sources? And yet, according to USDA census data, 99% of all animals raised for meat, dairy, and eggs in the United States still come from factory farms. Unfortunately, many of the labels that people look to to assure that the products they are purchasing are coming from animals who are raised and treated well are essentially deceptive and meaningless, and those products are still essentially being sourced from factory farms. Take these labels, for example. What comes to mind when you see these products? You're probably envisioning something idyllic, like a large grassy field where chickens get to run around and peck in the dirt and flap their wings and live a happy life free from pain and suffering. However, time after time, when activists have gone and investigated certified humane farms, they've found something very different. When friends of mine with the group Direct Action Everywhere investigated a whole foods supplier, animal welfare rated, certified free range chicken farm, this is what they actually found, far from the idyllic image shown on most packages. The reality is most terms such as cage-free, free-range, and humanely raised have minimal to no legal requirements and conditions and are mostly just made-up marketing terms intended to evoke the impression that the animals, the products we are buying came from, were raised and treated humanely, when the reality is usually very much the opposite. But because I'm quite familiar with the arguments against veganism, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, but what about those small, local family farms where animals truly are getting to be outside, treated well, and raised in more truly humane conditions? Isn't that truly humane meat? Isn't that truly an ethical way to raise and kill animals for food? One of my favorite ways to investigate the ethics and impact of any given choice or decision is to ask the question, 
what would the world look like if everyone did what I was doing or everyone wanted to make the choice that I was making? And when we pose this question to the idea of eating animals from these truly small local farms, it becomes clear that this is in no way a realistic or sustainable option. We simply cannot feed the world's demand for meat using these farming methods. In fact, according to research published in 2018, if we were to convert all American beef production right now to truly, fully pasture-raised and grass-fed beef, we would need more land than is in the entire lower US 48 states, just dedicated to grazing cows, just to feed the American demand for beef. But beyond the practicality and sustainability of such farms, there's another issue here. And that is that we are breeding and bringing animals into existence for the sole purpose of using and commodifying their bodies. We control every aspect of their life. We determine the conditions they live in, when and how much food they get to eat, when and how they get to see friends and family members, when they get to last see their babies. They cannot consent and they cannot escape. And at the end of the day, no matter what kind of farm these animals were raised on or how well they were treated, they all still end up in a slaughterhouse, sometimes seeing, hearing, and smelling others go before them, before they too are hung upside down, have their throats slit, and then are dismembered piece by piece so we humans can eat their flesh. And I think it's really important to remember that these are individuals we are talking about, individuals with unique personalities and likes and dislikes, just like our pets, our cats and dogs that many of us know so well. I think it can be really hard for us humans to wrap our heads around the magnitude and scale of suffering and death that we are talking about when we say 70 billion animals are killed every single year. So to make it more real, I wanna tell you the story of Dante the cow. Dante was born on one of these idyllic free-range beef farms in eastern Colorado. And when he was just a few months old, he was forced to undergo the standard but incredibly painful process of dehorning and castration that most cows in the beef industry are subjected to. And on this particular day, this process resulted in a broken leg, ribs, shoulder, and jaw for Dante. And since his tiny body was so broken and in so much pain that he could no longer stand up, he was considered useless and left for dead in a field. By the time rescuers were able to get him and transport him to a vet, his injuries were considered so serious that he was not expected to live much longer, much less ever walk again. But Dante had a fierce will to live. And that combined with the care and support of his wonderful rescuers, as well as the love of his newfound family of other cows rescued at the sanctuary where he was taken to, allowed him to prove everyone wrong. When I met Dante in 2013, he walked somewhat clumsily with a distinctive limp, and I could still see the spots on his head where his horns had been burned out of his skull as a baby. And although he was somewhat hesitant of new people like me, he was still incredibly sweet and gentle, and quite eager to grab a snack of apples from us on that hot summer day. Meeting Dante and hearing his story absolutely broke my heart. But it also motivated me, like nothing else, to keep speaking up for victims like him and asking the question, how can we justify the violence and oppression of raising and killing animals for food if we don't have to? Now, I recognize not everyone in the world has equal access to healthy, whole plant foods. There are numerous rig systems in place that prop up animal agriculture and make the most violent, environmentally degradative, and unhealthy foods artificially cheap and readily available to people. These same systems also harm farmers and slaughterhouse workers and others who are forced to live or work nearby. Yet the vast majority of people with access to even a basic grocery store absolutely have the ability to choose cheaper, healthier, and more sustainable plant-based options. And for all the arguments and justifications I've heard for eating animals, when it comes down to it, most people will admit that they continue to do so simply because they enjoy the tradition, convenience, and taste of meat, dairy, and eggs. So if you raised your hand at the beginning agreeing with me that you think it's wrong to hurt animals unnecessarily, 
then I would like to ask you, what is your definition of necessary? Do taste, tradition, and convenience justify taking the literal life of another being? Because while I think it's extremely important to discuss and push for systemic and institutional changes, if we ourselves are unwilling to take a stand for justice and forego a burger for a bean burrito, for the literal life and suffering of an individual we say matters, how do we really expect anything to ever change? So if you agree and would like to see a world with less suffering and more justice in it, why not align your actions with your values and go vegan? As I've shared today, we have a very broken food system that most people don't like, yet are still supporting. And I believe the simplest and most profound solution to this is for every one of us as individuals to stop accepting marketing and propaganda at face value and to take personal responsibility for our food choices. If every professed animal lover were to stop eating animals and animal products and choose truly humane plant-based alternatives, the world would be a much more compassionate, just, and sustainable place for all beings. And I think that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.